Tales from the Wild. Stories from the Heart. A journey into the mind and soul of fired up business professionals where they share their vision for the future. And hear from a different non profit organization every month as they create awareness of their goals and their needs. Dive into a world of untamed passion as we join our host, Shireen Buerta, for this month's episode of Friends from Wild Places. Right, so, fast forward a little bit forward. Eventually, my master gunnery sergeant, the guy in charge of the ammo, uh, ammo company, that's the, the unit that I was a part of, heard that I was a computer guy. And he says, eh, Carlos, uh, I heard you're good with computers. I said, yeah, I am. So he put me to the test. And sure enough, I was able to network, run networks, websites, all that stuff. So I ended up getting a secondary job as a computer guy in the Marine Corps. So although I didn't get it as the ASVAB, I got it as a secondary MOS. And then throughout that time, I became a martial arts instructor. I also became a, uh, a Marine Corps recruiter. 2003, I came back home. During the, the first four, I wasn't a recruiter yet. I was just ammo tech computer geek and martial arts instructor 2003 i come back to miami and this is where it gets really interesting because i knew how to make websites i had two good friends of mine that worked in radio and they said you know what you know hey we we're doing a show you want to come by you know hang out what else sure what up you know i was collecting unemployment because once you leave the military you don't have to get a job right away they give you kind of like a little bit of transition time and uh, i went there and oh my god i had a blast i loved it there's something about radio that just got me excited and uh, one of the things that they were really known for was uh, prank calling people, right? Prank calls were, I mean, I, I used to prank call when I was younger, and these guys were getting paid to prank call. So I'm like, wow, this is fun. I want to be a part of this. So I said, you know what, guys? Tell you what. Yeah, I'm not going to charge you anything. Let me run the website. They didn't have a website. They didn't really have anything. Let me run the website. I'll come in the morning. I'm used to waking up early. I'll be here every day, and uh, I'll just run the website. I'll do a bunch of cool stuff on the website. They're like, yeah, sure. We can't pay you. It's, like, it's okay. You could, you could do it. In fact, they gave me VIP tickets to concerts. They gave me uh, clubs. They got me bottle services. I got to hang out with a bunch of celebrities. So I felt like I got a lot more than I gave them, which is, I felt guilty, but th that's why it was so fun. Anyways, so one of the prank calls that, that really put them on the map was uh, a prank call to Hugo Chavez. That was the late dictator of Venezuela. And uh, that was a hit. That was fun. Then at the time, Hugo Chavez was best friends with late dictator Fidel Castro of Cuba, obviously. And we said, okay, look, let's use the call. Let's cut up the call from Hugo Chavez because we know they're best friends. And let's use parts of it to prank call Fidel Castro. Ah, oh, come on, Carlos. Come on, guys. You can't do this. It's not, it's not possible. Well, Enrique and Joe, they, they don't care. They said, we're going to try this. They, they are untouchable, basically. So eventually they called the city hall. The gimmick was Hugo Chavez just left Cuba and we left a very sensitive briefcase over there, if you know what I mean. That's the idea. And then people got nervous. Hey, we need the briefcase back. Can you please get us, you know, help us out? So people kept on transferring them and transferring them and transferring them. Joe, which can do basically any accent, he sounded purely from Venezuela. So they didn't, they didn't think anything of it. And eventually it got to Fidel Castro. Fidel Castro actually was talking on the phone with them saying, yes, we'll help you find the briefcase. We're going to make sure it gets done. I'm in total agreement or something like that in Spanish. And then Enrique jumps in and says, are you, to are you in total agreement with everything you've been doing with the island? You, you know, all these expletives that you really can't say on the radio. But it was a moment that no one you know, would be able to forget because this guy is untouchable. Not even the CIA was able to get to him. And two pranksters from a radio station were able to get him on the phone and just basically, you know, lean on him. And that was the moment where he said, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm going to say, it. he said, Mari Gong Song, that's what he called it, right? So that moment, we bought mariconson.com, right? And that became the website for the actual show. And because of this call, like, it was all over the news. It was on CNN, BBC. It was on Fox. It was everywhere all over the world. Two jocks, prank call, late dict uh, not late, dict dictator Fidel Castro. And everyone wanted to hear this call. So this is where I built this email list capture funnel. This is basically a, a system designed 
to capture email addresses in exchange for some type of value. The value was you get to hear the call, just tell us what email address to send it to. And because of this, we ended up building an email list of over 250,000 email addresses. And then it was that moment that the radio station said, whoa, wait a minute, we can monetize this. Let's go ahead and Carlos, can you help us with this, with the marketing, with the digital stuff or whatever? So this little volunteer gig that I was doing, having fun, I mean, they were making millions, but whatever. I was getting paid some money and I got VIP tickets and I got to hang out with celebrities and I got to be a part of this. It was great. So that was the introduction to how digital became a real world connection to everyone. A side note, because of that call, we were fined uh, by the FCC because we didn't get Fidel Castro's permission to be on the air. So th that's another story. We ended up collecting like, over $10,000 worth of pennies to pay the fine. But that's another story. Um, now, fast forward. Because of that little thing, I, I started my side hustle making websites and doing these different things. And then I became a Marine recruiter. So Marine recruiting, I was known as Sergeant Poppy on the radio. So I, was, I got to hang out in uniform and I ended up buying sergeantpoppy.com because, you know, everything was on dot coms. Um, and then I learned sales. I learned marketing and sales through the recruiting station. MySpace was a big hit at the time. So I used MySpace to attract recruit, well, not recruits, but like, you know, prospects and leads. I did a lot of class talks so I can do public speaking. And man, I was really filling up my calendar with a bunch of people. So I learned all that stuff and I was able to automate a good amount of it. But if you fast forward to 2016, that's where everything really changed for me because I went from part-time side hustle, making websites here and there to just jumping ship completely in 2016, full-time with my agency, which is now Miami Marketer. And now I build these systems. Now the technology is so mature now that you can do so many different things that now I build it, I teach it. And at the, at the end of the day, my special spot when it comes to people who I service are basically high ticket uh, service experts that want to acquire more customers and I can build a system that just fills their calendar up and, and that's where we are today. So that's my story. I'm, I, I tried my best to keep it short, but uh, that's it. That's wild. Amazing, amazing story. Yeah. So you build websites. That's if we had to break it down, right? You build websites and you kind of create some, I'm going to use the word lead generation in some, it's beyond my comprehension, but something like that to drive more traffic or consumers or customers to the website. Is, is that correct? Yeah, that's a good way to put it. Essentially, everyone has a way that they're generating customers. Um, I just find a way to put it online. So that way it's scalable and it can happen no matter what time and day it is. Websites are a part of it. And now there, there's a distinction between websites and like landing pages. Landing pages is what I really do. A website, the way I see it, it's almost like a brochure of of a business, an actual landing page is specifically a page where there's one goal to achieve. So if you're landing on this page that has your calendar system, that the goal is to get people to book the appointment. When someone books, they're taken to another landing page. That landing page says, good, your booking has been confirmed. Click here to add it to your calendar. You know, that's the first one is websites. We do do that, do do that. But the second one is what we specialize in creating these little interfaces to get objectives achieved by that visitor. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm so glad you confirmed that because I think the other day, Tanya and I were having this discussion and we didn't really know exactly what you do. And so we thought, you know, websites, right? As you've just explained to us, and thank you for taking the time just to narrow it down to the specifics of of exactly what you narrow down to, you know, that's your niche. Yep. Yeah, I'm. <laughs> I'm glad. Oh, yeah, absolutely. That. I get that all the time. Listen, you're not. You're not alone because the, our marketing is the actual industry, but then there's a subsector called digital marketing, and then under digital marketing, then there's marketing automation. So I'm like at a third level down, but if I were to kind of just simplify it. I build the system that generates leads and landing pages is a part of it. Yeah, we could do websites. It's kind of like a lawyer. A lawyer, once you get your license, you could actually practice anything as long as you're legal, you're licensed. However, there's family lawyers and there's bankruptcy lawyers. So there's always little different niches. And mm -hmm. uh, yeah, a lawyer is one thing, but 
you always want to find someone that specializes in one particular strength so that way they can make it more uh have more success with that that job so yeah Okay. So as you said, there's obviously lots of other businesses that do what you do. So in that case, my next question would be, what makes your business unique? So why should I go with Miami Marketer and not another business that also has a similar niche to you? All right. Well, number one, military principles, military fundamentals. We're all about creating processes that are effective, measuring results, and trying to focus on getting the job done. So everything that we do here at Miami Marketer, that's our core for everything, how, how we do it. The second thing is our unique selling proposition is we help high ticket service experts, $1 million plus in sales. That's our primary objective. So if you are already offering high ticket services, our job is to build you the systems so you could break 1 million and go up from there. Because mm -hmm. if you're a service expert, you don't have so much time, you, you, but you need to have a consistent flow of leads and, and sales. So uh, we build that system, we install it so we can make sure it gets done. And, and we've built it time and time again. We built, uh, well, not we as my marketer, but me as my marketer. I've built campaigns for companies like Coca Cola, Universal, Disney. So all of those principles that I've learned that they were able to apply, I can actually apply it to other industries. And high ticket service and experts seem to be my sweet spot. for doing this. Nice. I love that. Thank you for clarifying. It's important. I think it's so important to, to just share what is your differentiator? What makes you that one that highlights, that jumps out in the crowd? So thank you for that. So, you know, your choice to become a business owner, you know, what was your mission at the end of the day? You decided to, okay, I'm going to be a business owner. What was your mission in the back of your mind? You know, where did you, what was your big plan? Okay. So this is a question that I ask myself almost every day. What am I doing? Why am I doing this? And I've reflected and here's what I've come up with. So you've heard the expression, you are a product of the people you hang out with, right? So basically I prefer to hang out with people that want to change lives for the positive, obviously. And being an entrepreneur and being a business owner, you're a special breed because this is a roller coaster. This is not an easy life to live. I mean, you've got, you've got a business you're trying to build. You're the only one that really believes in it, but then you doubt it. And then am I wasting my time? And then you have your family. There's a lot that goes into it. it. Unless you've been in that position, you don't really know what that is. So surrounding myself with people like that really makes me feel like, okay, how can I help someone like that, that wants to change the world, that is crazy enough to try to do this? How can I help them? And it's like a party of a bunch of crazies that we're trying to make the world a better place. And that's what I've realized that I do better with. If you're not an entrepreneur, it's okay. I'm going to hang out with you. You know, It is what it is. But there's something special about hanging with an entrepreneur or business owner that It's like a Marine, you know, unless you've been in the Marine Corps, you're not going to know what it is to, you know, pound sand and, and have to do a bunch of pushups in a sandbox. Um, so, you know, it's the same concept. There's like a camaraderie, a brotherhood, and it's a mutually beneficial relationship where I can make money helping you make money. I feel like I'm doing my part because you're going to change lives. And because of me, I'm going to help you change even more lives. And that's kind of like how it all came together. And I feel like that's my purpose, helping people that want to change lives for the, for the better. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. That's awesome. I wanted to ask, um, Carlos, as far as your martial arts, and you had mentioned, I know you're big into physical fitness. Can you shed some light on that as far as, you know, what area of martial arts do you do and how, you know, how do you recommend our listeners? Maybe some people are trying to get healthy in the 2024 year. Uh, what would you recommend? You know, some, maybe some strategies. Okay. So. Number one, I, I know I'm not trying to brag, but people tell me I look young, all right? I'm 42 years old. I'm not as young as people think I am. And going back to the martial arts, it was called MCMAP, M-C-M-A-P, Marine Corps Martial Arts Program. What is it? Basically, it's a concoction of the most common 
techniques that you're likely to run into in the time of war, in the time of battle. So there's a lot of grappling and all that stuff. And so you're going to have a bunch of different things. So there's not one in particular. Basically, if you're going to end up on a floor, these are the techniques you need to try to get your the upper hand in this current circumstances. Um, it really wasn't about the inner peace. It really was. It was just about self-defense. Basically, that's what it was all about. So what I learned about that whole process is all about creating muscle memory, doing things over and over again to the point where you no longer think of it, breathing and so one of those things in muscle memory. So martial arts is, that's the type of stuff that I learned. And then I, I taught it to other Marines, but now when you fast forward to the time where I'm at now, I took my body for granted when I was younger. I think, you know, so many of us, when, you know, when we were younger, oh, I could keep eating this pie of pizza. I could eat all these wings. I could eat all these fries. I could eat all these burgers. And uh, eventually your body says, okay, I'm done. I want to hold on to this for a little bit longer because I like it so much. And, you know, my, I get little love handles here and there. So I learned that you only get one body. The body you have is the body you're going to deal with for the rest of your life. That's like an epiphany moment for me. I'm thinking, wow, like I cannot believe I took all this stuff for granted. I would have taken vitamins more serious. I would have taken supplements more serious. I would have taken protein more serious. I was just eating whatever I wanted to eat. So now being physical, I don't do the crazy workouts I used to do in the Marine Corps. I don't do CrossFit. I mean, there's some crazy stuff. But I've learned that you have to stay active. I don't, I don't work in an active job. I work in sitting, literally sitting down on the desk most of the time in front of a computer screen. But you have to take the time out to create a routine that fits your lifestyle, but is still healthy. So I'm not trying to plug F45, but F45 turned out to be a really good uh, thing for me. It's like a team environment workout setting. They come up with new exercises every day. I don't want to think about it. And I will not do those exercises on my own. I need to be a part of that setting to do that and let them do the thinking for me. I'll just do the work. And it's, oh my God, it's a lot of work. But I also go and walk to the gym. I actually live about 1.6 miles, literally 1.6 miles from the gym. So that's how I get my 8,000 steps a day. So I create a routine, by the way, for that walk, I'm doing this because I'm, I'm like simulating, I'm typing on my phone because I actually do research, study while walking to the gym. So I'll listen to podcasts or whatever, which I heard your podcast this morning as well that on my walk. I heard three of them because you know, I listen in double X speed. Um, and in Spotify, I could put 2.5 2. speed, which is why I get so many CEUs. Fun fact. I listen to all my stuff in, in double speed. If not, I can make it faster. And I leverage that time to not only do exercises, but do work, you know, crush out documentations or whatever, talk to JatGPT, do research. I do so much during that time. So if you could come up with a routine that complements what you're trying to achieve overall, it becomes easier. And uh, it takes a while, but once you do it, it's like second nature. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. There's just so many things that I wanted to say while you were talking. So I won't mention them all, but the first thing I want to just say, I don't know what it is about Miami because you and Tanya don't look a day older than 29. So I don't know what you're drinking down there, you oaks, but you need to share it with our <laughs> South Africans on this. It's side. called arroz con frijoles y, y viste o, o pollo a la plancha or something, all right? Oh, <laughs> we can sit some your way. Can I just say something else? So, sure. you know, Spanish, I am uh, definitely picking up some classes because I am definitely wanting to learn a second language, especially after my pilgrimage in Spain and <laughs> France. Well, there's two Spanishes. There's the real Spanishes, and then there's the Miami Spanish. It's like a whole different Spanish over here. I guess like there's like a Spanglish style. <laughs> I mean, if, if you've ever been... A Obviously, you guys have been a part of our chapter, but for that one listener that's listening right now, mm -hmm. if you come to our chapter, we throw in all kinds of little Spanglish. To the, mm -hmm. We say Dale. Yeah. We, we do a bunch of stuff. And for fact, we're called the Dale administration. And you have to join to figure out what it is. And Pitbull made it more popular, but that's been a, a Miami thing for yeah. so long. Dale. So, I love that. Yeah. You, you have to, anyway. you'll, the Spanish you'll learn in, in our chapter versus the chapter, the, the Spanish from Mexico and, 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 and Spain 
it's like a whole different you know, Spanish is such a diverse language. Right. It's almost like English. It's like you got South African English, you got Australian English, you got UK, you got country, you got Miami, bro, you know, all kinds of stuff. So <laughs> where's your family from? Where's your where's your ancestry? Like where's your history? Um Puerto Rico. Puerto, Puerto Rico. Rico. Puerto Rico. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. yeah, everyone thinks I'm Cuban, but I'm not. I'm Puerto Rican. Puerto Boricua. Rican. Okay. Mom and dad both? Both? Yeah. Mom? Both of them. I was born in New York, so I'm a New Yorican. Okay. But uh, the New Yorkers, they're like, ah, you're not from New York. Get out of here. You're from Miami. The Puerto Ricans like, tu no eres de Puerto Rico, papá. Vete, vete para allá. Vete para allá. You're not from here. Go, go over there. The Miamians, they're like, oh, yeah, bro, you're not Cuban? I'm like, no. <laughs> ah, you Cuban. Come here. So the Cubans accepted me. My wife's Cuban. My kids are part Cuban, Puerto Rican. So, hey, I love you. Cuban. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. You be reading. All right. So back on track. So I just wanted to ask. Sorry, you, I'm going to keep throwing no, you off no, track. That was my <laughs> fault. I, just, I had so many things I wanted to say, but anyway, I don't want to take our thought patterns off track here. But so, as a business owner, the journey that you've had, you know, owning Miami Marketer and the road since then, you know, can you? Share with us what is probably the the biggest struggle you had to face as a business owner and how you got over that. Well, I have not gotten over it. All right. It's called imposter syndrome. All right. So I, I do this every day. Just all this marketing automation, all these strategies. Like I'm actually creating a course right now. And the course is called Gear, uh, the game plan for engagement, acquisition, and retention. And it's basically a collection of everything that I've been learning throughout the years since I've been doing this. And as I create this, this all comes out natural to me. I've even developed my own frameworks, my own methodologies and my own terminology that it, it, it just makes sense. And as I do these things, I feel like, does no one else know this stuff? I mean, if I know it, why doesn't no one else know this? Mm -hmm. So whenever I start teaching about this topic, I always feel like, someone actually probably knows all this stuff. I'm probably repeating what they already know. And that little demon inside of you or inside of me, I'm just telling me, Carlos, you're wasting your time because you're teaching something that everyone already knows. So you're not an expert. And that imposter syndrome always kind of just creeps in. And I haven't overcome that. I still deal with it time and time again. But when I actually have a session, when I actually do these public speaking uh, moments, you can see people writing notes that people are like enlightened. They're like, oh my God, that you can see these little aha moments. And when I see that, those are reminders that I'm doing the right thing. I'm not an imposter. I am helping people out. And, and I don't do that enough. You know what? I just feel blessed whenever I see that. I'm thinking, okay, maybe I do know what I'm talking about. Maybe I am doing the right thing and uh, making a, that difference. So imposter syndrome always is the demon that keeps showing up and uh, makes you want to give up. And and when you get out there and you start giving your advice and teaching people, and then when you see the results actually, you know, happening, you could, you could say, okay, you know what? You're not an imposter. You are the real deal. Keep pushing forward, but it keeps coming back. Tune in next week for part three of Friends from Wild Places. You've been listening to Friends from Wild Places with Shireen Bueta. Be sure to subscribe to the podcast from the links to catch every episode and unleash your passion.